Father, we praise you this morning for the cross, for the fact that you loved us enough to send your son into this world to rescue us from our own self-destructive tendencies, our rebellion and just our, our, our lostness. So God, today we, we thank you for that and we want to follow you. And yet we know that you're going to lead us to the cross. And in our, just in our natural state, we want to run from that. We, we don't want the self-denial and the sacrifice that you're calling us to, and yet, and yet we want the life, we want the forgiveness, we want the peace and the hope that only you can give. So Lord, we recognize the tension today, and we commit ourselves to following you. Lead us to the cross. Take us out of that, that destructive lifestyle that we've been immersing ourselves in, and heal us, and Fill us with hope and with purpose and with life, because only you can do that for us. We commit ourselves to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. Grab one of the Bibles in the pews. They look a lot like the one I'm using uh, turn to page 1,248, and you will find Philippians chapter 1, at least the part we're going to be looking at. And uh, by the way, if you need a Bible, uh, please take one of those with you. We'd love for you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God and let it be part of your life. If, uh, if you need that, uh, then those are for you. So uh, they're for you to use, they're for you to take, as long as you're going to use them, uh, help yourself. Hey, uh, today I want to ask you some questions. Oh, by the way, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, because that's that special day, and, and yet you say happy Mother's Day, and there's, you don't know what to say after that. Right? It's kind of awkward then. Silence, you know, kind of, yay. Um, so, <laughs> happy Mother's Day. And uh, I want to ask you some questions, but they're not like the questions your mom used to ask you, right? When you were a teenager, you kind of got the grilling. Where were you last night? Who were you with? What did you do? Why were you so late? Why didn't you call me? And today's kids don't have the same excuse that, you know, we all had, which was I couldn't find a pay phone. Uh, what are we talking about? Today's kids don't know what a pay phone is. Uh, so uh, I don't want to grill you. I want to challenge you to consider some of the big questions, questions that influence our lives greatly. And, and the thing is, I know a lot of times we get distracted, we get busy, and we kind of put those questions off. Like, I'll get around to that. I'm too busy. I've got these urgent things I got to take care of. And we don't deal with the important, life-changing kind of questions. Um, so here's the questions. What is your purpose? What is your purpose? What are you here for? What do you focus your life on doing, accomplishing, being? And in what is your hope? In what is your hope? Uh, what is it that gets you uh, up in the morning going? Uh, what are you uh, driven by that, that fills your life with that passion to keep going? Now, I ask these two questions because somewhere in life we need to know because these two questions, your purpose and your hope, are going to jump out and they're going to grab you at some point and you've got to have an answer or else they're going to completely and totally uh, uh, knock you out. And I know this because I've had these conversations, sometimes with teenagers or young adults who uh, don't know that they have any purpose whatsoever in life. They've lost all hope, and they're at that point of wanting to take their own life. They, you know, they, they become suicidal because they don't see a reason for existing. They, they think they'd be better off dead, and, and the world would be a better place without them, and they've lost hope. And, and I'm trying to convince them that there's a reason to go on, that there is a purpose to life, and they're a part of it, an important part of it. Or, or sometimes it's conversations with that 40-something guy who woke up one morning and said, is this all I'm working for? Is this all I'm putting into? Is this what the life is all about? There's got to be more to it than that. And, and I try to convince them that they don't really want to just uh, give up on everything they've poured themselves into for 20 years and start over. Or sometimes it's a senior adult who is uh, who's dying, who's weak, who's, who's uh, you know, lost their ability to do all the things they want to do. They're in pain. Each day is a struggle, and they ask the question, why am I still here? Why has God left me here? See, these are questions that you got to know your purpose, and you got to know what your hope is 
if you're going to answer them. And today the Apostle Paul, in the passage we're going to look at, look at, tells his friends in the Philippian church, these people that he's close to, that he's, that he's intimate with in his sharing his life and his struggles, he talks about his purpose and his hope in, a, in an incredibly powerful way. Picking up verse 19 of Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which shall I choose? I can't tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus, because of my coming to you again. Paul very directly explains his purpose. For to me, to live is Christ. To live is Christ. That's Paul's purpose. He said, this is what uh, is my focus in life. And don't those words just kind of captivate you? Don't they grab you? Aren't they inspiring? To live is Christ. It's lofty. It's noble. It's kind of religious. Right? Because if you grew up in the church, you've heard those words before and people throw them around. To me, to live is Christ. But what does that really look like? What does that mean? What, what is a life that is focused on living for Christ as their purpose actually look like? So when you look at Paul's life and his teachings, uh, I think to live for Christ can be summarized in two statements. For what, what Paul, when he's talking about to me to live is Christ, first of all means that he's going to promote Jesus' mission. He's going to promote Jesus' mission. He's, he's all about that. Uh, in Philippians 1.12, he's already told us that he doesn't care about his circumstances because it all served to advance the gospel. He said, look, I, I'm doing this and I'm, I'm excited about what God's doing because it, the, the kingdom is moving forward. In 2 Corinthians, he, he wrote to the church in Corinth and he said, if anyone is in Christ, in Christ they're a new creation, that old things have passed away, all things become new. This new life is available. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, as he wrote to the church at Rome, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Every single person who believes is going to have a life-changing experience with Jesus. Later on in the book of Romans, he says, if we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Paul wanted people to know that Jesus loved them, that he died on the cross for them, that he could change their life and forgive their sins. So he said, to me, to live as Christ, I want to promote the mission of Jesus. After all, Jesus came to find the lost, to redeem the broken, to heal the sick, to set the captives free. Paul says, I want to be a part of that mission. So to live as Christ is to promote Jesus' mission and to represent Jesus' values. To represent his values. In the, uh, the letter to the church in, in Galatia, Paul writes uh, extensively about this battle that takes place within each one of us between our natural man, the flesh, and the Holy Spirit of God that God puts in us when we confess Jesus as Lord. And, and, he, and he says things like this. He says, if we walk by the Spirit, we won't satisfy the desires of the flesh and, and then he goes on to talk about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, Paul says, But the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against things like these there is no law. In other words, that's what God wants to build into our lives so that <clears throat> you and I can represent Jesus to the world. Here at Calvary, one of our values is character, and we describe it this way. We believe that you cannot represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. Think about it. You can't really represent the Son of God unless the character of Christ is in your life, and the Holy Spirit is trying to build that character in your life. 
So let's do a little quiz. What did Jesus say was the most important character issue for us? What do you think? Love. Yeah. Thanks for those being bold enough to shout it out. Love. Yeah, that's not really a trick question if you've been in church at all. I don't think you have to be in church to kind of know that. What does God think is important? Love. Right? Jesus said this. He said, the first and greatest commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He, look, he goes, the whole law and prophets, the entire Old Testament hangs on these two statements. In other words, it, it's what categorizes everything. Every commandment is about helping us to love God or helping us to love our neighbor. That's it. He goes, so love is the big deal. So to live for Christ is to love like Jesus loved and to tell people the truth that only Jesus Christ can change their lives. That was Paul's purpose, to live as Christ. That's what he's doing. What's yours? What's your purpose? I ask because it is tragic to have a purposeless, meaningless life. There's a lot of people who try to do it. You know, you kind of go, well, you know, what's life all about? I don't know. I'm just doing this. I'm doing that. I'm trying to have some fun. I'm, you know, whatever. But it it doesn't ever, ever take shape. doesn't ever focus on something. And suddenly you wake up one day and you go, I don't really have any meaning to life. It's just about me. It's just self stuff. And, And that'll leave you empty. It's also tragic, though, to have purpose, but to have that purpose focused on something that doesn't satisfy. Because you can achieve your purpose and you can grieve that success. Because it doesn't satisfy your heart. It doesn't, it doesn't really give you that, that substance to hang on to. Like, for instance, let's just say your purpose is being successful. I want to be successful. I want to make money. I want to get accolades. I want to achieve. I want to build a business. I want to be a successful person. A lot of people have that as their focus in life. Right? So what happens when you succeed at everything and you get all the stuff you want and yet you lose your spouse and you lose your family and you lose your friends and you lose yourself? Because Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? So we, we want to pick the right purpose, but a lot of times we pick something that looks good on the surface. It looks lofty and noble, like say, you know, something that's really you know, kind of popular right now. We're going to have a great family. We're going to have this great, wonderful family. And, and we're, going to, you know, we're going to pour ourselves into our kids. And we're going to bless our kids. And we're going to, we're, you know, we're going to take them to Disneyland every year. And, and we're going to you know, be at every event that they have, every baseball game, soccer game, dance recital, cheerleading thing, everything they do. We're going to pour ourselves into them. We're going to be the super parents. And, and they're going to grow up and leave. And, and we're going to be like empty and broken because everything that we focused on. Have, and, and by the way, if you were that kind of smothering parent that you know, never gave many space, they probably won't come home a lot. <laughs> or what's worse is you pour yourself into your kids and you raise them to be so dependent on you that they can't function without you and they never leave. <laughs> right? So what's your purpose? What are you pouring your life into? A healthy life needs an eternal purpose. Paul says to his friends, to us, the best purpose you can have is to live for Christ. And the reason that you can live for Christ is because he has this hope. This hope. Paul's hope is that the next world is better for those who know Jesus. Next world's better for those who know Jesus. Verse 21, he says, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. In in, uh, a couple of verses later, verse 23, he says, I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Do you realize how countercultural that value is? In a world, uh, in a culture that we live in that values life uh, and, and extending life and, and staying alive more than anything else, right? I mean, we idolatry, uh, yeah, we've made an idolatry of being young and healthy. 
So we're going to look young and healthy even if we're not young and healthy because we got you know, surgeries that can help us do that. And, we, and, and science is always saying, oh, we're going to crack the aging code and, and soon we, people are going to be able to you know, live forever. No, you're not. Can I just tell you something? It is not a science problem. The reason that we die, it's a sin problem. See, we started off in this world uh, having, you know, life forever because the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. And, and as long as they didn't touch the, the wrong tree, then, then Adam and Eve would have just kept living. But Romans 5.12 says, For just as through one man sin entered the world, and through sin death, therefore all died because all have sinned. Yeah. See, death is a sin problem. We get old, we age, we die because of sin, not because uh, God doesn't love us or because it's a science problem. And so they can tell you, oh, we're going to solve the aging problem. <laughs> Jesus already did. <laughs> okay, it's a theological issue. He gave us life eternal. And, and, and so Paul says, look, to die is gain. It's better. And he knew that as a follower of Jesus Christ, as someone who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who believes that Jesus died on the cross to pay for his sins and was raised from the dead and, and, and because he's made a commitment with his life to follow Jesus Christ, he knew that heaven was his destiny. He didn't deserve it. You know, he deserved hell, but he knew because of the grace of God that heaven was going to be his eternal home and that's where he's going to end up. And for everyone who's a follower of Christ, that reality is true. Eternal life is waiting for us. And Paul knew that heaven was beyond our imagination. Can't conceive it. It's too good. It's, it's too wonderful. Have you ever read the book of Revelation? It, it, it's so cool because John, you know, he's talking about the stuff that he sees and he hears and what he's told. And, and, uh, and he gets to the part where he's trying to describe the, the physicality of it, what it looks like. And, and when you read it, you've got to kind of understand that he's like, um, it looks like, uh, and there's giant diamonds, Gates, walls, diamonds, emeralds, rubies, I don't know, streets, gold. It's cool, okay? He can't describe it because it's beyond words. He's seeing something that we can't even imagine. And he tells us what it's going to be like in Revelation 21. He says, and death shall be no more, and there'll be no more sorrow or crying or pain for the former things are passed away. Okay, let me just ask you this question. Can you even imagine a life without pain? No, because, I mean, you're like, I want a life without pain. I, I long for that, but I can't imagine it. You know, what would it be like to wake up every morning and not hurt, right? You know, or, or you stub your toe. And it's just, it, we can't really conceive of it. And, and we can't really grasp the beauty of the new creation, the, the relationships and the depth of love that we're going to have with one another, the joy of life that, that never ends. It's mind-blowing. We can't grasp it. But this is the hope that fuels our lives, that this is what is waiting for us because of Jesus Christ, because of his sacrifice and the forgiveness that flows to us. This is God's promise to you and to me, that heaven is waiting, that to live as Christ and to die is gain. And, and if we grasp that, if we, if we really let it soak down into our souls, it changes how we live. We stop living with fear because we know what's to come. We stop living, uh, uh, you know, uh, where we're trapped by our insecurities because we realize this is what God has promised. He's going to take us there. We, we live boldly, courageously. Uh, we live joyfully because no matter what we're going through, no matter how difficult it is, it only gets better. You see, that changes our perspective. That, that hope fuels our purpose. At least that's what it was doing with Paul. He says, to live is Christ, to die is gain because heaven is what's waiting for me. And I know the moment I bring up heaven, right away we start going to these crazy places with our questions and our thoughts and what's it going to be like and how is this all going to be. And I get asked lots of questions. So let me, let me try to answer some questions. Like there's practical questions people want to know. And, and they say things like this to me. Well, when I die, uh, does it matter if I'm buried or if I'm cremated? And I've got friends that argue that and argue, well, you should be buried, not cremated. And I've got friends who say it doesn't matter. And, and here's what I know from Scripture, that God does not need any piece of your sin-tainted flesh that you're living in right now for the new body that you're going to get in heaven. He doesn't need it. So it doesn't matter what you do with the body that dies. As far as I'm concerned, just flush me. 
okay? Because I'm getting a new one. I don't need this one. Do with it what you want. And then sometimes we get the kind of silly questions, right? Like, hey, what are we going to look like in heaven? You know, and, and people always go, I want to be tall and thin and have this, you know, great looking hair and I don't want to have any fat and all this kind of stuff. And here's the deal. You're going to be content in heaven and there's not going to be any of these false pretenses of what beauty is and isn't. See, everyone's going to see you for the true beauty that God created in you. And, and, and you're going to be, you know, completely and totally okay with that. But then I start thinking, what will we look like in heaven? Wouldn't it be an absolute, you know, total crack up if the, the perfect shape, uh, you know, in heaven is like that of a bowling ball? <laughs> and, and like we're all three foot tall and 400 pounds and no hair? See, it would be, you know, you think about that and you go, that's good. Oh, I wouldn't be happy with that. Yes, you would. It's heaven. You don't care. Okay, I'm just telling you. And since we're on the subject of heaven, let me just dispel some heaven myths. Because our culture talks about heaven a lot, and they have a lot of unbiblical, crazy ideas about heaven that, that we just kind of assume. It becomes part of our imagery because of the movies and the TV shows and books and stuff like that. So let me just, just shatter some myths, some misconceptions about eternal life. Okay, myth number one, heaven's going to be boring. Now, they never use the boring word to describe it, but all the pictures, all the, the scenes, when somebody tries to depict heaven, it does not look like someplace you really want to go, Right? Because it's all clouds and harp music and monochromatic, right? Why, if the world we live in that is sin-tainted and fallen is diverse and beautiful, why would everything in heaven be white? Right? Because every time you see heaven depicted, it's just clouds and people in white robes and every, everything's just white. That's the color of heaven. And, and I'm like, that's boring, who wants to live someplace like that? And let's just be honest about this. Harp music? I mean, really? I can do harp music for a little bit. It's kind of pretty. But 10,000 years of harp music, that sounds like hell. <laughs> I, I, seriously? Who came up with this idea? You see, the biblical truth is that heaven is a dynamic place. It is a place where God's creative passion and beauty is revealed on a level that we cannot even imagine because we are living in the shadow of things to come. If you see beauty here, heaven's going to be a billion times more beautiful than that. Because not only will it be beautiful, but we'll be able to see it with the eyes that are correct by God. Um, so heaven's not going to be boring. Myth number two, we become angels. Okay, we get our wings, you know, and, and this is kind of that Facebook theology that kind of floats around out there. And, and I get the reason that we kind of want to put it that way, but can I just tell you that the Bible says very specifically in Genesis 1 that you and I are created in the image of God. That phrase is not used about any other part of creation. God made people to live and reflect his image. God made angels to be his messengers. And by the way, I challenge you, look up every encounter with an angel or what's considered an angel in Scripture, and you will find that 90% of them do not mention wings. Okay, and the ones that do have wings are weird, okay? Okay. Just telling you, you know, you're like, I don't want to be that kind of angel. That, that just is. And, you're, and the thing is, you can't be. People are people. Angels are angels. God is God. It stays that way in heaven. Okay? Myth number three. It's all about us. It's all about us. You know, a lot of times people kind of, you know, in telling stories or jokes or, or whatever, they make it sound like heaven is some kind of five-star resort where we get waited on for all eternity, right? We're going to go to the buffet, and then we're going to go play golf. They, they make heaven sound like you're on a cruise ship or something. Think about this. We call Jesus our Lord, our King, our Master. What does that make us? Servants. Yeah, when was the last time that you heard about servants sitting around getting waited on? No. In heaven, we get to serve God. And, and we love doing it because think about it. In the Garden of Eden, in perfection, before there was sin, Adam and Eve had a responsibility to tend God's garden. 
We are made to serve God. We get to serve God. And, and in heaven, we will serve him out of joy, out of our gifts, out of our abilities, the way that God created us to serve, and, and we'll use them to glorify God, and, which makes me think, I don't know what you're going to be doing in heaven, but I'm pretty sure in heaven, they're not going to need preachers. <laughs> so I kind of figure, I'll probably get to clean toilets, <laughs> right? But I know some of you are going, oh, poor Pastor Chad, I have to clean toilets. Don't worry about it, though, because if we poop in heaven, it won't stink. Right? It'll be like roses. <laughs> Deep theological conversations. That's what we're having. <laughs> no, really. I, you're, you know, go home and read Revelation chapters 4 and 5. And, and take a look as John opens up a window to see what's going on in heaven. Because it's all focused on praising God. It's all focused on celebrating Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us. That he is worthy of our praise, of our love, of our adoration, of our gifts. It's all about him. We get to live and serve our perfect Savior in perfect joy. You see, that's our hope. That, that's why we can live differently. That's why we can live courageously. That's why we can live with purpose. Because we know that to die is gain. Now, I need to take a moment at, the, at this point and just uh, address something that I know is a risk as I preach on this subject and talk about how wonderful heaven's going to be. And that is that some of you are tempted by Satan, by the enemy, um, to end your life. Okay? You struggle with depression. You struggle with uh, that place where you're just thinking, I really would be better off dead. And now the pastor just said, hey, heaven is gain. And some of you, uh, Satan's going to twist those words and make it sound like, yeah, you should go ahead and end it all. And, and, and I just want you to know if that's you know, what, how your, your thought is, that Satan is tempting you to hurt yourself in the same way he's tempting addicts to use, the same way that he's tempting uh, uh, those that are filled with lust to indulge those. It, it, it's all part of that temptation because he wants us to destroy our lives. And while heaven is better for those who are, who are followers in Christ, God never wants you to end your own life. Can we just be really clear about that? The will of God is for you to live for Christ. And, and so if you're struggling with that, please talk to one of us. Uh, find somebody on the prayer team or one of the pastors uh, after the service and, and let us help you. Let us walk with you through that. But here's the thing. God wants you to endure because God will redeem your life. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. It is not what God wants you to do. He wants to show himself mighty in your life. He wants to fill you with hope. He wants to carry you on. He wants to, to allow you to bless others. And, and if you end your life, you can't do any of that. So please hear me on that. And, and don't, don't let the, the, the possibility or the thought of heaven distract you and, and take what is meant for good and, and let Satan use that for evil. You see, to live is Christ. To live is Christ. And we don't want to live foolishly. We don't want to focus our lives on an empty purpose. And, and we don't want to live fearfully. We don't want to have a life focused on avoiding death at all costs. We can live faithfully. We can give Jesus our best. We can represent him with our lives and our words, whatever the cost, because we know the best is yet to come. So what's your purpose? In what is your hope? And do you want Jesus to change you today? Let's pray together. Father, thanks for loving us. Thank you for the mercy that gives us life eternal. Even though we deserve hell, heaven is what you have promised to us. It's our destiny for those in Christ. And God, we thank you for that. Fill us with that hope, that expectation. Let it fuel our lives so that we can live passionate, committed lives, serving Jesus Christ, representing you with our words, with our deeds, with the, the truth that we share that only Jesus gives hope of a life change. So, Lord, we commit ourselves to you. I pray that every person here would hear your voice today and would be able to answer those questions about purpose and hope in a redemptive way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.